Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. This is your host, Jack Young. If you notice, introduction's a little bit different. We've got Brother Bruce Fry in studio today. Yes, sir. And uh, he was with us this last Lord's Day, yesterday, Sunday, and we had a, just an amazing time in the Lord, and uh, I'm so thankful to get to meet him, and uh, so thankful our church family gets to know him. And uh, your blessing yesterday, Brother Fry. Well, praise the Lord. Y'all have been a blessing to me. Thank you for having me. And he was uh, giving us our, his testimony in the morning service. Please go and watch that video. That is, and it was just an awesome service. And he's playing, singing, giving his testimony, giving uh, the gospel just in a very clear way. And uh, you can find that at Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church on our, our YouTube channel. And that uh, sermon will be up. And uh, it's a sermon, too, that you can share with uh, friends and family who are not saved. And we had a bunch of people uh, get saved yesterday, and we're thankful for that. Yeah, thank the Lord. <laughs> that was good. So how long have you been playing and singing and giving your testimony? Um, well, <clears throat> full time, uh, April the 25th was fifth, uh, 20 years. Okay. 20 years, yes, sir. And I'm a 43-year-old man, and you got saved at my age. Yeah, I got saved when I was 43. Over 24 years ago in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, music's been a big part of your life. It has been. And it still is. Yep. And uh, how important is music for God's people? You know what? Music opens the heart. Mm-hmm. It, and it really does. And I thank God that he allowed me to use it. You know, when I first got saved, I was scared, um, thinking maybe I just needed to just give it up, you mm-hmm. know, So finally, I just got on my knees in front of my guitar, and I said, Lord, if I can use this for you, I'd like to. But if I can't, if it's going to cause us a problem, I said, I'll just... No problem. You give it up. Yeah, I'll give it up. It was not going to be an idol for you. Exactly. Because it had been for so many years. Sure. Music was the idol of my heart, you know. Yeah. And um, and what's the difference between uh, music before you got saved and music after you got saved? Well, the music before I got saved was just fleshly and worldly and... Just appeal, you know, appeal to the flesh more than anything else. And now that God's given me the, the talent to be able to write spiritual songs, you know, that uh, appeal to the spirit. Mm-hmm. And I, I thank the Lord for that as well. So in in uh, Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, mm-hmm. how what's the difference between just uh, philosophically between worldly music, secular music, and Music that honors God. Well, the focus, of course, is on the Lord, mm-hmm. and uh, the, you know, usually the songs that I wrote before the the focus was on either me or you know worldly things mm-hmm. and stuff. So, you know, I tr- I try to write songs that that'll tug on the heart a little bit. I've always been a ballad writer anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never was. I never enjoyed playing uh, like the clubs where people were dancing in front of me. I wanted them to pay attention. You know. <laughs> And you enjoyed the story of yes. a song, and you were a country exactly. musician, mm-hmm. and country music has a lot of storyline to it. Exactly. Yeah, and um, and so, to me, Christian music is um, people testifying to the Lord and testifying to those people around them the truth or truths from Scripture, right? Either by form of testimony about what the Lord has done for me, or in a form of worship, I'm I'm complimenting God or praising God for who He is and what He does, right. or we're worshiping Him through a doctrinal truth. Um, and uh, these a, tra- a good song is going to transcend time. It's going to be evergreen. I mean, mm-hmm. people can sing it, sing the um, you know, how firm a foundation. Or uh, I think of Almighty Fortress is our God. Martin Luther wrote that over 500 years ago. Right, and we're still mm, we're still singing it today. Yes, sir. Because it transcends time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The neat thing about music is, that, you know, there's no new thing under the sun. So it's really hard to write something that somebody else right. hadn't already done or whatever. But you know, I had some music in my head <clears throat> one time, and I hadn't, didn't have any words, so I opened up my Bible. I started reading and praying, and then I realized every word I needed was right there. Mm-hmm. And I, I wrote a song called God's Word, and it's all scripture. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like a, a salvation song because I had prayed. I said, Lord, I, I would really like to write a song to where there would be enough scripture in it to where people could hear it and get saved. There was a man, perhaps you know who he is, and I, I, I apologize to the audience for not knowing who this guy is. But when I first got saved— he had, I somehow came across his CD or I had a tape and then I actually ordered CDs from him and he sings nothing but scripture songs. 
and it's with his guitar. And he, and he didn't get saved <clears throat> until later on in his life. Mm -hmm. And he says that he says, since I was older when I got saved, I had a hard time memorizing scripture. And so he put all the scripture to song, and it's beautiful. Right. You know who it is? I do not. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't remember who this guy And Well, I'm first thing that goes to memory is hard to recall that second thing for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, but yeah, so a scripture song. You want to you play it for us? Oh, yeah, I can do that. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself It is the gift of God Not of works Lest any man should boast For all have sinned And come short of the glory of God there is none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him Should not perish but have everlasting life I say unto thee, except a man be born again He cannot see the kingdom of God Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wonderful. Amen. Amen. <laughs> hey, is it is it true that you know Andy Griffith? I did. I got to meet Andy Griffith on the Matlock television show, and I did that with him, yep. And, sure did. and uh, did you get to sing with him at all? No, didn't get to sing with him. Uh, you know, we were shooting a scene that day. My band and I were in the background. They were eating lunch, and we were kind of playing in the background. But every break he had, he kept walking over there and talking to us. Hey, what chord is that you're uh, playing, this yeah. and that and stuff. The director kept going, Andrew, get back over here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you could tell he was the boss. He said, I'll be there in a minute. So, yeah, they, yeah. yeah. He was pretty cool. How about Hank Williams Jr.? You know him? Yes, I do. He's on the front of your track. Yeah, he is. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Well, I was in a club one night. <clears throat> in downtown Nashville, Tennessee, called Skulls Rainbow Club, and uh, it's kind of one of it's one of those clubs. In, like all clubs are in Nashville, um, everybody wants to get on stage and sing and be seen and heard. And so, when you go in, you put your name on a list, and when they call your name, you get up and sing a song and go sit down and listen to somebody else or whatever. But this particular night, I didn't even put my name on the list because I didn't feel like singing. I was having a little pity party, you know. And 
So I was just sitting at the end of the bar, kind of drowning in my misery, and the band was playing, and all of a sudden, Hank walked through the door. Mm-hmm. And my first thought was, how can I use him to get what I want? <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, that was my first thought. So I jumped up off the bar stool, was making a beeline towards him, and the, the guy that had the house band there grabbed me by the arm on the way by the bandstand there, and he said, hey, Bruce, will you get up here and sing so I can go hang out with Hank? He's a friend of mine, you know, and I thought, no, you need to do your job. Let me go hang out with <laughs> uh-huh. Hank, but they let me sing there so much I felt obligated, so I said, all right. So I grabbed the guitar, got on stage, and he and Hank went and sat down, and then the guys in the band said, well, Bruce, what do you want to sing? And I said, well, I said, Hank's here. Let's do one of his songs. I said, but I don't like the way he does it. I want to speed it up and kind of do it my style, you know, and they said, well, he might not like that, and of course, I was a cocky rooster back in those days, and I said, well, I don't care what he likes. And so we did the song and did it too fast, and the next thing I saw, he was standing in front of me, shaking his head, going, boys, that's way, way too fast. And the guys in the band said, we tried to tell him, Hank, he wouldn't listen to us. And I looked at him, and I said, Hank, that's the way I do it, man. Mm. He said, well, let me show you how I do it. So he got on stage, and uh, we did the song over, and then we started doing some other songs. I, I had no idea what they were, and... He would sing a verse, and then he'd hand me the microphone. I was having to make up words because I didn't even know the words <laughs> to the song he was singing. And and I can do voices like Willie Nelson and other people like that. And so I was, you know, throwing some of that in there. We were kind of having some fun. And, and, and during this time, was that uh, when he was o- opening uh, Monday Night Football? Oh, yeah. Wow, that was in the prime yeah, of yeah. his popularity. Yeah, he was, in, he was the Monday Night Football guy, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how – and – um so that night, how, how did it how did it all turn out? Well, as uh, <clears throat> after we got through doing a few songs together, he he looked at me and he said, "You don't mind if I sing one by myself?" And I said, "Sure, no, I don't care." So I walked off the stage and he started singing a song, and I can't remember what the song was about. I remember it had something to do with his mom and dad or something, but halfway through the song, he just started weeping and crying, and all of a sudden, you could have heard a pin drop in that place, and nobody knew what to say, and. He just finally put his hands in there, and he said, I'm sorry, I just can't sing anymore. And he walked off the stage, and he put his arm around me. He said, you know what I'm talking about, don't you, boy? And, of course, I was lost, and I wanted to use him to get my record deal, so I told him, I said, sure, Hank, you know, (laughs) whatever you say, you know. And then we went and sat down at the bar and started talking, and I was telling him about a song that I'd written about his dad called They Made Hank's House a Honky Tonk, and he sounded fairly interested in hearing it, you know, so... I, I wanted to, I said, hey, well, you want me to go grab the guitar? I'll play it for you. And he said, no. He said, just put it on a put it on a tape, you know, bring it by the office tomorrow. And I said, okay. So, which I did that. But the whole time I talked to him, I just watched the tears stream down yeah. his face. And it was one of those um, things that I never forgot. Yeah. And uh, well, So what kind of impression was that making on you? Because he, he was really where you wanted to be in life. Exactly. And, you know, my first thought, when I saw him crying on the stage, I thought, man, he's got everything I've dreamed about since I was a kid, and he's just as miserable as I am. And it's almost like the Lord was showing me, Bruce, you can have all of this, and you're still going to be miserable. Mm-hmm. You know, what shall it profit a man that he gain the whole world right. lose his own soul? Yeah. So that, you know, it was one of those things that was in the back of my mind. Yeah. And that was probably about four years before I got saved when yeah. I met him. Yeah. Let's circle back around to Hank Williams, Jr., Mm-hmm. But you have um, got to rub shoulders with a lot of famous people. Yes, You're talking about uh, singing with Mary from Peter, Paul, and Mary. Right. And uh, you, you told Mary your favorite song that they did. Oh, man, what a mistake that was. Oh, it was <laughs> awful. Yeah, we were sharing a dressing room together, and we we were doing this club in uh, downtown Washington, D.C., in Georgetown. And uh, been there with her three days and hadn't really talked to her that much. And I said, man, I need to say something to this lady. And so I told her, I said, look, I said, I've really enjoyed opening the show for you these past few days. And I said, but you hadn't paid, played my favorite song. And she said, what is that, Bruce? And I said, uh, California Dreaming. <laughs> and she said, Bruce, that was the mamas and the papas. <laughs> and, oh, man, I felt like an idiot, man. So, yeah, that is very funny. Yeah. yeah. And, but, uh. Yeah, the, for those who don't know, mom, the mamas and the papas were uh, CIA assets. At least I read that in a book one time. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> during the oh. 60s. Yeah. Uh, but um, anyway, you met a lot of these famous people, mm-hmm. rubbed shoulders with them, 
and uh, they they were your heroes, your models, your yeah. mentors. I mean, you, you yeah, I used you, to have Elvis Presley's poster up on you sure. know my bed and stuff. You sure. know, that's what I wanted to be the next yeah. Elvis Presley. Yeah. yeah, and they were the goal. Yeah, uh, and uh, they, they were the dream. Yeah, they they were the idols in your life. Yes, uh, but yet, when you rode shoulders with them, they were as empty as you were. Yeah, and you know, most of the I was. As we were talking earlier, I, I said most of the people that I met that were, that were stars were were fairly nice people, mm-hmm. very kind and stuff. Some of them, you know, had a little big head, but I did too. You know, sure. With what little stardom I had, I was <laughs> mm-hmm. full of myself. You know, but for the most part, they were pretty nice people and stuff. But a lot, a lot of times, it was the people that worked for them that thought they were the hot stuff. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now, so. I think your your track, your personal testimony track, you're probably the only person out there that has uh, a picture of Hank Williams Jr. on their gospel track. <laughs> I think so, yeah. And how many doors has Hank Williams Jr. opened up for you? It's it's if, no, for it's, those who haven't seen his track, it's uh, you with long hair, long blonde hair. Right. Was your hair naturally blonde back yes. then? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I mean, he he really looks like a rock star. He doesn't look like a country musician. Yeah, I, I was the country. I was the rock and roll look with the country heart kind of guy. And so he he's on the front with Hank Williams Jr. and they're singing together. Got microphones in front of them. Yes, sir. And uh, so, how many doors does that open up for you? A lot, because you know when people see that and they see Hank on there, you know it, it just draws them to it. They want to see what it mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. I was a matter of fact, I was in Alabama one time, and uh, the preacher was getting my, my hotel room set up and. Uh, I saw a man standing over there that was a maintenance guy. And so I went over and handed him a gospel track. And the first thing he said to me, he says, I, I won't read that. And in my heart, I thought, hmm. And I looked at him. I said, you've been hurt by a church, haven't you? He said, yes, sir, I have. And I said, well, look, I don't even have my church name on there. I'm not trying to win people to church. I'm trying mm-hmm. to win them to Christ. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, but then when he saw Hank on there, he went, is that who I think it is? I said, yeah, that's me, the one with all the hair. And he went, no, 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 the other guy. I said, yeah, that's that's Hank Jr. <laughs> uh-huh. He said, I'll read that. Oh, uh, yeah. and then, then on the inside, you have a picture of you and Andy Griffith. Yeah, I was on the Matlock television show yeah. with Andy. Uh, yeah. Me and Ange. <laughs> <laughs> we were best friends, BFFs. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, that is, re- yeah, that's really great. And that opened so many doors. And I've seen it with my own two eyes here the last couple of days, just handing those tracks out to people. This yeah. is me, and this yeah. is Hank Williams Jr. Um, I can't remember, one young kid, he must not know who Hank was. We were at Buffalo Wild Wings after church right. last night. Uh, and he came back. Who did he think that was with you on there? Oh, I can't I, remember. He said somebody. Yeah. He, He's like, how long ago did you meet? You know, and he, it, it was another country star. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He said, well, that was, and a lot of people think it's Charlie Daniels. A lot of oh, people okay. think it's Charlie Daniels when okay. they first see it. And, yeah. you know, cause you know, they both wear the cowboy hat kind of deals. So. Sure. Hey, what do you think it is about your testimony? I mean, cause we all have a testimony. Sure. <laughs> if you're saved, you have a testimony. Right. But what is it about your testimony that touches people's lives? Well, I think one one thing about it is because I talk about when I was a kid that um, my mother shared a gospel track with me. She thought it was time I joined the church, and uh, and I read the track, got emotional, and the preacher came by our house, and I, they said I prayed a prayer. I don't remember doing that, um, but, you know, I prayed the prayer, got baptized, and joined the church, and but I didn't get saved, and I think that's a part of I think there's a lot of people who have prayed prayers and they're trusting in the prayer instead of trusting in the one they're praying to the Lord sure. Jesus Christ. And so they have a false profession of faith like I did. Yeah. Cause yeah. I honestly, me, me, me as well. Yeah. I honestly thought that if something happened to me that I was going to heaven because I prayed the prayer, got baptized and sure. joined the church. So my trust was misplaced. And, and um, intellectually you assented to all the doctrine of the gospel. Oh yeah. I believe that Jesus lived. I believe he died. I believe he rose from the dead. The I Bible believed all was that. the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. I believed all that in my head. I never, yeah. I never questioned yeah, that. Yeah, me too. Never questioned that. But the thing about it was, was that, uh, like my band members and I would go and eat dinner before our show, mm-hmm. and they knew I was going to pray for the meal because mm-hmm. I was spiritual, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. But my prayers were so wicked, I didn't know it. Uh huh. Because I would say, God, thank you for this food, and me and the boys are going to be partying tonight, you know, drinking and watch out after us. So you're like Ricky Bobby, you mm-hmm. know, praying before the race. Oh, I've never seen that movie, <laughs> okay. but <laughs> but yeah, I, I was uh-huh. asking God to overlook my sin, you know, yeah. and He can't do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I didn't know any better. I was just lost. 
And then uh, when I was in Nashville, when God started dealing with my heart, and I started reading the Bible, <clears throat> he started kind of, I, I started realizing, man, I, I need to change some stuff, man. I, I'm going in the wrong direction. And, and of course, I still wanted to get my record deal, but I thought if I could just clean my clean up, clean, God, clean God, my life, God would reward you for that. Exactly. Then yeah. he would let me get my record deal and get everything I dreamed about since I was a kid, you know? Yeah. Now, now my, yeah, my, my theory is that if you're raising a Christian home, the, um, most, most people are upholders of the, the, the family standard. So right. yeah, if you're up in the, in the Bible belt too, I mean, it's Jesus, NASCAR, Budweiser, you know, that, that's kind of like how, how it goes. Maybe not in that order. Right. But, um, but culturally, if you're raising a Christian home, you're going to be intellectually Christian. And then also I think in a good Baptist church, like going forward and getting saved, you know, you have to do that at some time and go forward and say the prayer and then get baptized afterwards. I mean, my kids know this. I mean, they've known it from a small, from when they were young. And so I'm trying to, you know, you try to be very spiritually sensitive right. to whether, you know, I, I know I can. I'm bigger than my kids. If I, I can make them pray, right? <laughs> you know, exactly. Um, it, and so I would think the natural pathway for most kids, not everybody's going to be a black sheep, right? Um, some kid might rebel and say, "I don't believe in Jesus," and but but uh, the average child in your household is going to uphold, uh, yeah, you know, Jesus is God, is my God, and the Bible is the Word of God, mm -hmm. and and have an intellectual understanding, and they might even be in church. And attend church because that's our community. Right. And a good citizen, you know, is a good uh, part of their community. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can have a lot of people that are going to church faithfully. They can do it in the flesh and um, and intellectually assent to everything the preacher's saying. Right. And know it's right, but um, in in their spirit, they're lost. Yep. And, and that's where I was. I'm. I mean. <clears throat> if you'd have asked me if I was a Christian, and I, as a matter of fact, I did a radio interview like this one time, uh -huh. and the the girl was asking me all kind of questions, and just out of the blue, she said, "Are you a Christian?" I said, "Yes, I am." Sure. And then, but later on in my hotel room that night, I was laying in the bed looking up at the ceiling, and I went, "I should have never said that." Yeah. Because if I'm a Christian, I sure don't act like one. Sure. And I think you know that was one God was dealing with my heart at yeah. that time. Yeah. And I know one of the things that I felt is that, um, and I can hear this from young people too, talking and they start drifting away, especially when they get into young adulthood. Right. And, uh, and they, they start making their own choices and every step is a step away from the Lord's people and God's house and um, away from the church and godly influences. And they'll say something like this, well, this is just who I am. And, yeah. you know, I know that frustration because that was me as well, because I did not have Jesus inside of me. Exactly. And so I was following the flesh. I couldn't walk in the spirit. I didn't right. The spirit was not. Um, not in you. Yeah, was not in me. Right. And so there's a frustration there when you have Jesus in your head, but you don't have him in your heart. And your heart is leading you the opposite way of Jesus. Right. And you're going to come to a crisis point. Yep. You know, my wife asked me one time, she said, do you think maybe you got saved when you were a kid and just got away from God and came back? And I said, no, honey. I said, I was lost. Yeah. Because I continued in my sin. And here's the key. It didn't bother me. Right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I remember talking to a young man at Bible college. Now, I, I went to a uh, full year Bible college. Beef. I mean, that was just the thing you're supposed to do. And yeah. it was pretty dutiful. I mean, I, I broke a lot of rules, but I never got caught, you know, right. that type of thing. And I hung out with the other unsaved kids at Bible college. Uh, and they're there, let me tell you. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and they gravitate together. <laughs> oh, yeah. Birds of a feather, man, of the yeah. same ilk, same spirit, man. They, they can find each other out like that drop of a dime. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I knew the Romans Road. I knew all that stuff. And, um, yeah, so I was doing a lot of things that, you know, we're – would grieve a Christian soul. Right. And I remember talking to a young man when I finally did get saved, went back to Bible college, studied to be a preacher. He's talking about how he got backslidden when he's 19 years old. And he's like, man, I was doing a lot of stuff and I, I was just so miserable. And I remember saying to him, I did the same things when I was 19. And I loved every minute of it. Yeah. It didn't bother me one bit. Exactly. And that's because the spirit was not in me saying, Dang, right. you ought not do that. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have that love relationship to the Lord. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm breaking the Lord's heart right now. I exactly. Said, yeah. Well, that's what happened to my brother. My brother got saved in Texas in 1977. And uh, 
he was going to take the money that he made. He was knocking on doors selling books, and he was going to take that money and either go to California or New York and be a model and an actor. He's always been in drama and stuff like yes. that. And so he got saved in Texas, and when he came home, he, uh, I mean, he was a brand new baby Christian. Yeah. He had n- nobody to mentor him or anything yeah. like that. And I had just started playing in the clubs and a, my old bass player from a rock and roll band that I'd sang with heard me in the club one night and he said, man, I'm tired of singing that rock and roll mass. He said, can I come play with you? And I said, sure, Gary. Yeah. And so it was just me and a bass player. And so when Sammy came home, he saw what Sam, uh, Gary and I were doing and he still had this dream in his heart to be a star. Mm-hmm. And he said, can I join you guys? And I said, yeah, come on, brother. Yeah. But once he got in there and in the clubs, the Holy Spirit was killing him. And I didn't know what was going on. And, I mean, we were singing a song one night. I don't even want to mention the title of it uh, here today. But I remember he just set his guitar down and went and sat down in a booth and started crying. Ah. And I said, folks, we're going to take a break, you know. (laughs) I went, what in the world, you know. And I said, brother, what's wrong with you, man? And he said, he said, I can't sing that song because it was a song about the devil. Yeah, yeah. And he said, I can't sing that song. Man. Yeah. And I said, well, we got plenty of songs, you know. We don't have to sing that one. He said, it's not just that one, man. And I didn't realize it, but, you know, God was chastening my brother. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. Now, you, you, you told me after that you, you got saved Yeah. that um, you always had to have something going on in the background. Yeah. Um, always so, had that so, noise. So it was one of the mornings. Yeah. After you got saved. Yeah. And I you went to the TV and turned it on. Yep. Yeah, and MTV was on, and uh, the Rolling Stones video came on. And I remember looking at it going, wow, that looks like hell. <laughs> I said, how could I have ever watched that? But I realize now, you know, Satan is blind to the minds of them which believe not. Absolutely. Now, so I, I, I loved rock music before I got saved. I mm-hmm. mean, that was my religion. I really right. thought that it had the answers for all life. <laughs> I mean, look how stupid yeah. you know you are before you come to Christ. Exactly. But man, when I got saved, all of a sudden I like started he- hearing lyrics and stuff. I think, good grief, that's yeah. talking about demonic possession, or you know, I like right. hearing these, and I never even never clicked before. Yeah, I, it didn't even. I didn't have any comprehension, you know, good or bad, about different things that were being said and right. different, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, different spiritual things. And so the Lord opens up your eyes. Yes, He removes those scales. Yeah, yeah. That's... What was it about you and your brother that uh, really drove you into entertainment? You know, um, I could sing even when I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I remember my third grade class. I had I had got a forty five record of Puff the Magic Dragon, which I didn't know was about smoking pot. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, you know, at that time in my life, we we do have a bearded dragon at home. Yeah, and its and its name is Puff. Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to I'll have to show you Puff later. Okay, but uh, that was my wife's doing. She must she I must have, had, have a background in uh, yeah and that uh, song or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I I learned you know I listened to that song over and over and learned all the words and. So I brought it to school with me, and I told my third grade teacher, I said, look, I, I, I really like this song, and yeah. I've learned how to sing it, and I want to sing it before the yeah. class. And she said, are you serious? I said, yes, I, I really want to sing it. Wow. And so she said, okay. Yeah. And so, you know, she put it on the record player, and I got up and sang Puff to Magic Dragon to my third grade class. It was my first wow, gig. you know, first concert. Yeah. Man. And then I tried in the seventh grade, uh, I wanted to join the choir or uh, the – what are they called, the chorus, the ensemble or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said that my voice didn't project enough. Yeah. You know, and so huh. I went, okay. And then I got, uh, my brother got a guitar for Christmas, and I got a snare drum and a cymbal. Uh-huh. And then we played for my mother's card party. That, you know, they played canasta and stuff like that on Tuesday nights. And so we we played a couple of songs for them, you know. And then I got a full drum set. I started a band called The Outer Limits in the seventh grade. That sounds cool. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we knew three songs, man. Uh huh. And we played three songs over and over all night long because that's all we yeah, knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, but then I realized really quickly I couldn't play the drums and sing at the same time, and I wanted to be out front where everybody could see me because sure. I was full of myself, you know. Sure. And so I got rid of my drum set, and my brother gave me his old guitar because he got a new one. Then I started playing the guitar in high school. Yeah, and, and then, your brother was a, mus- a mu- musician as well. Yes, mm-hmm. and um, and also on top of that, you both are very into boxing. 
Now, my younger brother was in the oh, boxing. Oh, your younger brother. My, yeah, my younger brother, and, Dale. And he, and, uh, he essentially went pro. Yes, he is a former two-time world lightweight kickboxing champion. Does a lot of stunts in the movies and stuff like that. Yeah, and he's been in movies. Oh, he's so been he, a bunch. he's an entertainer as well. Yeah, I am. So how did how did how did, so t- tell the folks what um, what movies some of the movies and movie stars he's he's uh, been. In. Well, he's he's done stunts on the Matlock television show. He's done um, he's done uh, the Steven Seagal movies. Yeah. Right? Well, uh, Jean Claude Van Damme. Oh, okay. Is in a he and I both were in a movie called Cyborg together <laughs> with Jean Claude. And, and tell the folks your acting role. Oh, my acting role was that uh, I came running around this fireplace in slow motion. And then Jean Claude came behind, you know, running behind me and shot me in the neck. I went <gasps> and fell, and that was my scene. <laughs> that's <laughs> that was my big that's star. Your claim to fame. My right claim there. to fame, yeah. But Dale, when uh, when I got that part in that movie, because I was playing clubs down in Wilmington, North Carolina, and they were doing a lot of filming down there. That's where they filmed the Matlock show and stuff. And and so these all these movie people were coming to my shows and I was meeting these people and I met the stunt coordinator and he's the one that invited me to come down and you know said and maybe if you know he said have you ever boxed and I said yeah I was, mm-hmm. he said or, or you, he asked me if I'd ever fought before and I said yeah I've done some boxing and he said well we're looking for people that know how to do that yeah. so so I went down there and got a little bit part in there you know really didn't do any fighting or anything yeah. just got shot in the neck you know yeah <laughs> but then uh so when I was talking to the director, I told him about my brother being a world lightweight kickboxing yeah. champ, and he said, you're kidding me. He said, could you call him? So I called Dale, gave him the phone. Next thing you know, they gave Dale a trailer with his name on the side of it, and he got a big part in the movie, and from there, that's where his stunt career started, you know. And he does uh, so what, what, refereeing so, so how now. Many, so how many kids are in the family? Three. Three brothers. So three, out of Sammy three Bruce brothers, all three, like, really, like, or like we're drawn to entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And what, our, what, what, what was it um, about the dynamics of your family? It just really drove you guys to. I don't know. Well, to our do mother. do other things besides working, a, well, yeah. <laughs> working for the man, you know. Or, well, our mother, our mother was uh, the hardest working woman in the world. She worked at a bank uh, and she raised us three boys because my dad was a truck driver. He was gone all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, she always told us, whatever you're going to do, she said, do it with all your heart. And whatever you decide to do, I'll, I'll back you 100%. Mm-hmm. And she said, but don't ever do anything halfway. Yeah. You know, and she was really instrumental in teaching us. I mean, because my mom, she was a little bitty thing, about four feet tall. When she said jump, we jump. Well, and that's amazing for a lady to tell, which is um, – most of the time, it's a father's role in the family to to push the boys out into the world. Right. But your mother really had that spirit. Hey, you put your mind to something. You work really, really hard, yeah. and you can do anything you set your mind to. And so mm-hmm. that was her mantra for yeah. you guys. And she'd go hear my brother Sammy preach. She'd come hear me sing. She'd go watch Dale fight. You know, she supported us in whatever we decided to do. And so your older brother got saved first. Yes. Mm-hmm. 1977, Sweetwater, Texas. Oh, so he got saved a long time. So 77, yeah. and you were 98. Yep. Mm-hmm. He prayed for me for 21 years. Because see what happened when he came back home, you know, and started playing in the clubs with me, um, you know, and then God dealt with him about doing that. So he quit. He got out. Mm-hmm. And uh, he really, that's why he really had such a burden for me because he thought he had such a bad testimony. You know, here yeah. I am a Christian and I'm yeah. playing in the bars with my brother. Yeah. What, what kind of testimony is that, you know? Yeah. And uh, so... <clears throat> You know, he just really had that burden for me, and and we're we're praying for my younger brother Dale now mm-hmm. to come to know the Lord. And you know, I I know Dale believes in the Bible; he believes in God. But just, yeah, he was kind of in the same. He's yeah. in the same position that you were in, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I can't see his heart or anything, but so right. I, I just don't know. Yeah, you know. So we're just praying. Yeah, asking God to do the work that we can't do because you know. I can't save anybody. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That's Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so your brother prayed for you, and he was a preacher for 21 years. Yeah. You, you had that. Did you feel like you um, like lost your best friend when, you're, when your older brother converted? Yes. Because he so radically changed before he was playing in the bars with you and everything else, and right. now he's preaching. Yeah. So I'm sure he still loved you, but he is living a different life. Oh, yes. And what had happened, we had a cousin of ours in Florida that owned a couple of dealerships and stuff. And he came to hear us play. And I mean, people were coming hours to stand in line to wait to hear us play, you know? So it was, it was really booming in our hometown. 
And so when our cousin came and saw that, he said, man, he said, I'm, you guys got something. And he was going to put all this money behind us to help us get a record deal. Mm -hmm. And then when Sammy quit, I mean, well, my bass player quit first. Okay. We went over to, uh, we went over to practice one day and Gary said, don't get out of the car. We're not practicing today. And I said, why not? He said, cause I'm, I'm going to go back with a rock and roll band. You've, you guys got to find you another bass player. And of course, I was a hothead, so I spun out of the driveway and <laughs> riding down the road. And I didn't know it, but Sammy had been praying, God, I know I need to get out of this band. I don't want to hurt my brother, but I'm tired of disappointing yeah. you. But I don't know how to get out. God, help me. Yeah. That was his answer mm -hmm. prayer. When Gary quit, Sammy said, no, if Gary, Gary's gone, he said, so am I. So I called my cousin in Florida, and I said, look, Sammy and Gary bailed out on me, but I'm still going to chase this thing. He said, I don't think you can do it by yourself, man. And I said, I'll show you what yeah. I can do. And, and I got yeah. mad, you know, hung yeah. the phone up. Yeah. Then I moved to Raleigh and put a band together. Got an independent record deal with Tone King Records there. And, you know, things were going good, playing in front of thousands of people, making a lot of money, but just wanting more. So but I moved to you were to not Nashville. happy and you thought that, yeah. that maybe the next level. The next level would we'll be it. it. If I could just get that record deal, then sure. everything would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So I moved to Nashville in 1990 pursuing that. Yeah. Yeah. 1990 Nashville and yeah. stuff stuff was hard in Nashville. It was hard. Oh in Nashville. man, there's so, so many. So, people. so th there was a thousand or ten thousand or maybe a hundred thousand Bruce Fries. <laughs> yeah, in Nashville, yeah. all waiting for the record deal. Yeah, the big joke is, oh, I'm in Nashville. I'm going to be a star. Really, what restaurant are you working at right now? You know. <laughs> yeah, that's sad. that's so sad. It's kind of like Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, every waitress out there is this aspiring movie actress. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's got to be tough. Tough competition. It is. My. Um, my boss's son in Oklahoma City, her name is Barbara, and uh, her son was a guitar player and a singer. Same thing, moved to Nashville, and I think he was there for probably five years, you know, and tried to make it and just came back home. Mm. You know, she gave me a, at Christmas, I think everybody in the in the in the meat department where I worked uh, got got uh, his CD <laughs> you know, right. from Barbara, and uh, yeah, you know, the guy. Uh, I, I mean, again, again, there's t there's tons of thousands of people yeah. there. They, they come and they go, and and sad to say that there's people out there waiting for people to come so they can steal Sharks. their money. Yeah. Yeah. They say, hey, you give me $250,000, I'll help you get a record deal. And people, you know, mom and dad sell the house trying yeah. to help their kid. And Make it big. St they just get robbed blind. It's It's terrible. an evil town. It is. It's wicked, man. Yeah. And uh, just sweet people. Just And there's, um, and we talked a little bit about this. Uh, just in conversation, but there, there's such a spiritual component to music. Yes. And um, I know, especially if, maybe just because I'm saved or whatever, but like when I, as a young person, man, it was like music was, uh, you know, some sort of a outlet to some mm -hmm. world. Yeah. I, I mean, all, all your hopes, dreams, aspirations, feelings, emotions, all these things yeah. um, are in, in song. And yeah. in rhythm and beat and whatever else, mm -hmm. um, something unspoken there. And, you know, you, you lived in that world. Yeah. And it draws you. It, it gets a hold of your heart. Yeah. Uh, it's so powerful, you know, because Satan is the, the prince and the power of the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the rock and roll culture, he's called the Pied Piper. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And that's the people are just following him straight to hell, you know. Yeah. And it's, you, you don't think that when you're in that culture, you know. And I, I had a young man. Tell me one time, he said, oh, man, he said, I'll listen to any kind of music. And he said, especially country music. There's nothing wrong with country music. And I said, look, you can talk to me about a lot of things, but you're not going to win this argument on country music because I was in it yeah. for years. Yeah. I, I know the danger of it. Yeah. It's just. In, in, any, uh, in any musician, their, their philosophy, uh, their thinking, um, the, their worldview is in their music. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, on a conscious and an unconscious level. Wouldn't you believe that to be so? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, I understand that in like the movie industry, like music is the most important part of a movie. Absolutely. It, and they it, really pay like about the most amount of money for the music because mm -hmm. the music tells you everything that's going on. Yeah. It you know tugs that, on you. You know, there's you a bad the guy line. in the room, you know, if there's yeah. a couple that about to fall in love. You know that if there's a shark in the water, mm -hmm. uh, you know you know that it's uh, time to get hyped up and play ball, or yeah. you know go win the boxing match, or what you know whatever yeah. you know the gladiator's about ready to kill kill his opponent. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and it's the music that tells you this. Yeah, and yeah, um, yeah and, and yeah. 
any movie that you see, whoever did the music for that movie gets paid millions of dollars. Yeah. The big, big dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I do. A, uh, I've got a message that I preach on uh, music. And, uh, and at the beginning, before I start preaching, I'll sing uh, a few songs. Mm-hmm. I'll, do, I'll do a song about Grandma's house. You know, you'll see people wiping, <laughs> wiping the tears out of their uh-huh. eyes. Uh-huh. And then I'll do a fun song like Nip It in the Bud yeah. about the Andy Griffith yeah. show and people laugh and yeah. carry on. And uh, then I'll do something else. Then I'll do a spiritual song and say, see, with music, I, I tell them, I said, with music, I can take you on a ro- emotional right. roller coaster ride. That's right. I can take you down. Yeah. I can bring you up. That's the power of it. That's right. It, That's and, the power. Um, you know, I love the scenes in Braveheart, man, where, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, the, uh, the the uh, what do they play over there in Scotland? What's that called? The the pipe, the bagpipe, bag plan, and you know I'm like, all right, I'm ready to march. Man. Yes. I'm ready to go die and bleed, you know, on the field. Yeah. And um, and you know, even back in the biblical times, I mean, there was the drummers keeping cadence. Mm-hmm. And they'll tell you today, even um, you know, even like you know, I so said the gym this morning. I don't get to choose the music that they play there, but right. it's like, boom, boom, boom. and, and uh, it's been proven scientifically that you can endure more pain with that pounding yeah. drum beat in the back. Um, and it's crazy. You know, you go in, you go into a lot of churches and they re- represent a nightclub and they have a pounding baseline beat, which has been proven that will release endorphins in your, in your body. Exactly. They give you a, a sensation of being high. Mm-hmm. It's a natural high. Right. Uh, and then also you have a light show, those strobe lights also doing something to your brain mm-hmm. and uh, really producing a little seizure in your mind. Yeah. And people feel something when they went there. Well, yeah, I mean, I remember one lady called me talking about the, the music at the uh, at the church. I, I said, well, we, you know, we, we sing hymns and psalms and hymns, spiritual songs to each other. And, um, well, I went to such and such church. And and I know the church that she was talking about. Right, and man. I could I could feel the Holy Ghost uh, moving in that service. I, you know, I didn't say this, but I thought, yeah, you know, maybe Casper the Ghost. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't no Holy Ghost. Yeah. yeah, you had tingles going up and down the back of your spine. But I've been in secular rock concerts and I felt something. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? And oh, we yeah. look at the crowd. Mm-hmm. If all of a sudden that music stopped and those people like dancing all around and going crazy, or whatever, if that music stopped, they would stop moving. Yep. That that music is actually moving mm-hmm. them. So I would say it's not only moving them physically, it's also moving them emotionally and then also spiritually. It's yes. moving them in a spiritual direction. Right. And so the Pied Piper is leading one day closer, one step closer, one mindset closer uh, to the pit of hell. Yeah. Um, the guys putting up our tent, Brother Fry and I were out there earlier and um, gave his tracks out to all the guys uh, putting up the tent out there. And uh, we were just sitting there watching it because we had to wait about a half hour to go pick up Brother Jenkins from the airport. And um, one of the guys were talking about what they, they're doing. And, and it's it's nice for us as preachers to, re, to remember this life. I mean, yes. they're out there sweating in the sun, putting up a tent. Uh, and talking about what they did on the weekend, I mean, right. you know, putting up tents, I'm sure is not very fulfilling other than the fact you get to do other stuff out, you know, get paid, get to do other stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the one guy was telling, uh, yeah, I went out to, I can't remember where, like Saranac Lake or some somewhere pretty far in the state of New York uh, to, to go uh, go see Dave Matthews Yeah, and traveling hours for some sort of a feeling. Yeah. And, uh, you know, something um, similar to what we're doing in the revival, only the opposite end of the spectrum. Exactly. You know, so he's traveling hours, spending, probably spent big bucks. I mean, he's got a stereo at home. He's got the internet. He, he could fire up some uh, Dave Matthews <laughs> if he wanted to on the stereo. Yeah. But he's going to go travel and, and have, See this, it live, yeah. have this experience mm-hmm. there. And so music, uh, you know, is a very powerful force. It really is. Yeah. It really is. And when I found out, one of the, the first times I saw how powerful music was, I I won a contest in North Carolina at a radio station, and my prize was to open for the Oak Ridge Boys at Carowinds. Yeah. There were over 6,000 people there that day. Yeah. And, and so when it was over, my parents and some friends had come to see me. So when it was over, I went walked down to the front of the stage when I was walking down the steps, and these two girls tackled me, man. <laughs> Just tackled me. Yeah. And, of course, the 
the security guards pulled them off, and they said, we'll take care of these girls. And I said, well, I don't mind talking to them. Just don't let them kill me, you know. <laughs> and then I had thrown my cowboy hat out into the audience, and this girl had caught it. And so she came up. She was holding on to it so tight and just weeping and crying. Yeah. And yeah. Her, her brother said, would you sign this hat for her? She can't even talk. Ah. Uh. And I looked and I said, "Man, this music, this music is powerful, man." Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You were saying how that you were at somebody's house. It was after a night or whatever. It was at some, and someone said, one of the ladies there was, "I can't believe Bruce Fry's in my house." Yeah. I can't believe Bruce Fry's in my house. And you're thinking, "What? I'm a nobody." Yeah. <laughs> and, and what what is this? Uh, yeah, very yeah, very powerful, influential, and it's uh, very spiritual, and really these uh, musicians. Um, they, they are a little G, a little God yeah. to, to many people because of whatever connection they have through their music, they're ministering um, emotionally, spiritually, physically mm -hmm. to a large group of people. Absolutely. And so, I mean, um, whether willingly, some people are, uh, some people are ignorant to the fact right. uh, how 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 the devil is using them. And then, you know, probably some people are not that ignorant to, you know, the fact that, man, they're, they're like right in the palm of Satan. Oh yeah. I mean, there's many rock and roll artists that, Hey, I know, I know this, the rock and roll is the devil's music. I've yeah. always known that. Yeah. But why don't Christians know that? Right. That's and they, they, they'll, I mean, yeah, I have quotes, I mean, in my file cabinet back yeah, here sure. about, I mean, <clears throat> every big time musician and the quotes about the different music or the uh, demon, de like openly admit the demonic possession. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them have, you know, the muse, the muse visits them and gives them the song. It came out of nowhere. It's not my song. I was just an instrument right. to, to record this song. Um, and man, that, that stuff, scary. yeah, that stuff is real. Yeah. Um, but the exciting thing now you're on the other end of the spectrum, you get to be used by the Holy spirit Yeah, and, Praise uh, the Lord. yeah. And you know, you, you're using a very powerful way and the, the, um, you know, the interesting thing too, is that, um, you're just yourself when you get up in front of people. Yeah. And you're not anybody else. Like we have Brother Jenkins. He's you know doing the preaching. Man, he's a camp meeting, barnstorming, <laughs> you know, stomping, pulpit hitting. You know, <laughs> he, and great preacher. Uh, but Brother Fry just gets up and simply tells his testimony, gives the, the plan of salvation, incorporates that into the sermon, and it's just one man talking to you, telling his testimony, playing songs uh, as uh, as he takes you through this testimonial journey. And man, people are just, you know, just uh, very, very moved. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. It's so all because of him. Hallelujah. Yeah. So you get <laughs> to be on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a joy to serve him. Uh, you know, I, like I say, I, I, I didn't get saved till I was 43. And I said, Lord, if I, I served the devil for 43 years, if you'll give me 43 more, I'll serve every day for you if you give me that chance. That'd you know? be great. Yeah. You'll we'll be, see. You'll be you'll be nervous when you're 86. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may come back before then. You never well, know. That, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great. Hey, well, why don't you give us a little uh, testimony and a testimonial song, and we'll wrap it up. All right. Well, <clears throat> after I moved to um, Nashville, and I was there for seven years trying to get my record deal, and struggling, broke, and tired, and that's when I went and bought a Bible, and I made a list. I said, I'm going to stop cussing. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop uh partying and doing all the bad things, thinking if I clean myself up that I could win favor with God, get my record deal and go to heaven, mm -hmm. everything would work out. And, but I couldn't keep my list, and I was struggling. And the whole time, my brother was praying for me during this time as well. And I went to hear him preach one night uh, down in our hometown there in Whispering Pines. The church was in Whispering Pines. It's in Carthage now. And I remember <clears throat> being in the very back of the church, and my brother preached the gospel, and he's and at he had an invitation at the end, and he said, if you're here and you're not sure you're going to heaven, he said, why don't you just step out and come down here and let us open the Bible and help you? And I wanted to walk down there, and I wanted to run out of the back of the church, but I just couldn't move. My feet felt like they were nailed to the floor, and, of course, my hair was hanging in my face. I was weeping and crying, and under my breath, I was begging my brother to stop the invitation, just let me go. And then he 
left the pulpit area and walked down and just was begging people to come to Christ. And but the whole time I was saying, "Same, I can't do that. I'm Bruce Fry. I'm the hometown boy that went to Nashville. Everybody knows my name." I was so full of pride. And finally, he realized nobody was coming forward. So he said, "Well, he said we're going to end the service. But if you're here and you're not sure heaven's your home, would you at least raise your hand? Let me pray for you." So my hand shot up in the back of the room, and he saw my hand but didn't see me. Prayed for me, and then a week later, in my apartment in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I got saved. I fell on my knees, cried out to God, and I quit trying to qu- quit keep my list. I just finally told God, I said, I'm a drunk. I'm a drug addict. I can't stop nothing. I can't quit cussing. I can't do nothing. And I said, God, I just need you. And uh, I don't remember all the words I said, but I remember telling him how sorry I was for my sin, and I was I was so sick of myself, and I was so sick of my sin, and I was tired of it, and I couldn't do anything about it. And I just asked him to forgive me, and it was like a weight was lifted off of me. And and then uh, I looked at the clock and it said 12.30, so I reached over and grabbed a pen. And I wrote, I gave my heart and life to Jesus at 12.30 because I didn't want to forget mm-hmm. it. And and then uh, just told him I'd go anywhere he wanted me to go, do anything he wanted me to do. I said, this is not my life anymore, it's your life. Just surrendered, totally surrendered. Crawled into the bed crying. And I remember I looked up to heaven and I said, God, I hope I said all the right words to you. But I realize now it's not the words you say that save you, but the intent of your heart as you pray. And so I got saved that night, and then I called my brother and told him what I had done. And he said when he hung the phone up, he ran around the house and screamed and yelled and fell on his face and thanked God and got up and took another lap. (laughs) He said, I had a Baptocostal fit. Amen. And uh, he called me back, and he said, when are you coming back to North Carolina? And I said, well, I planned on coming back this weekend. And so Sammy and his wife and children took me out, bought me a steak dinner and a birthday cake. And I was getting ready to blow the candle out. And I said, Sammy, do you remember a couple Sunday nights ago when you preached a message and had an invitation, extended the invitation? And and I said, do you remember that night, brother? And he said, Bruce, I'll never forget that night. I said, Sammy, that was me. That was your brother that raised his hand back that night. And he said, you got to be kidding me. So this is the first song, my testimony song that I wrote after I got saved. A young man, a bottle in his hand Not too long ago, that was me Every night, Saturday night Dim motel lights Not too long ago, that was me And that was me who had strayed Confused and afraid Counting all the cost That was me Kneeling by his bedside Tears flowing from his eyes Not too long ago That was me Jesus Christ led him in Forgiving all his sin And not too long ago That was me And that was me who had strayed Confused and afraid Counting all the cost That was me friend approached and said I heard you found the Lord I replied he was unlost that was me my Savior was unlost that was me Amen. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful wow. song. Praise the Lord. Brother Fry, where can people find your music at? Uh, they can go on my website, brucefry.com, and you can order uh, CDs there, or you can download from my website there. Amen. Yep. And if you're a preacher out there listening, you would be crazy not to have Brother Fry to your oh, church. You're very kind, brother. I'm, Thank you. I'm dead serious. <clears throat> I'm not an evangelist, so I don't exaggerate. 
<laughs> gotcha. <laughs> but uh, yesterday, man, was like in one of the top 10 of all time service. I've been in church my whole life. And oh, praise uh, the Lord. Lord used you in a great way. And uh, I know our people loved you yesterday. Mm-hmm. We were joking with Brother Jenkins on the way in, and he finished before I got to go to the punchline. Uh, he said, how did Brother Fry do yesterday? Brother Fry sitting in the back seat, and Brother Jenkins, I said, well, he did so good. He said, let me guess. He says, I'm, I'm going to do the singing, and he's going to do the preaching. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I, you know, I was, I was planning on uh, landing that on, you know, on Brother Jenkins, but he, he knew what was up. Uh, uh, and so dear we, friend. we appreciate you, and uh, God bless you, Brother Fry. Thanks yeah. for being on. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for watching or listening to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And we'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us at pastorthoughtsmail at gmail.com. Also, if you want to check out more about our ministry here, you can visit pastorjack.org. I do have a blog that I do write. I'd love to have you as one of my subscribers there. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.